Namaste, Balkidas. I'm very glad to see you here. And um, thank you very much that you kindly agreed to answer our questions. Uh, our viewers have many different questions. I will read them uh, a little bit later, if you'd be so kind to answer them. And before, I'd like to offer you this garland as appreciation for your coming here. Thank you very much for Saladas, and thank you. Namaste. Namaste. And it's, it's very nice that you've invited me here, and I am happy that our viewers have some questions that they would like answered. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, start our conversation with a first question. Uh, first question that it was sent to us is uh, followed. Um, how can I know about my mission, about my predestination in this yes. earth life? Yeah, that's a relevant question because everybody has this earth life and we need to know what to do. So we being the students of the Vedic knowledge, actually learn that we're spirit souls, we're not our material bodies. And therefore, we have an eternal destination, an eternal occupation that we should use this present life in fulfilling. Many people think, oh, I was put on this earth for a particular reason. See, I have a particular material mission to fulfill. According to one's karma, maybe they have certain predestined activities that they will be engaged in. Maybe they have predestined abilities, interests, etc., which will guide them in their material activities. But understanding that we're spirit soul, we have to go beyond these limitations and these influences. Because our eternal mission is to develop our spiritual relationship with the Supreme Lord. And out of that relationship, which will ultimately come to be based on love, we render service to the Supreme Lord. So everything we do in this life should be connected somehow with our service to God, our pleasing God, our doing the will of God, etc. And we're in these material bodies, now in the human form. We are on this one planet known as Earth. And therefore we can dovetail everything we do in our life with our relationship of service to God. Thank you very much. And our next viewer asks, um, why don't we remember our past lives? Uh, because I think that remembrance on, of our past life would help not make at least some of our mistakes in this present life. We forget that there's a perfect system in place here. We accept that God has arranged things as they should be. Uniquely enough, we in our human forms and our desires to be number one, to be the controller and the person who makes the rules and arranges things, always seem to find fault with God's plan. God's arrangement. Oh, it would be better if I could remember my past lives. Oh, I wouldn't make the mistakes I made then now. But the reality is we learn many things in this life through making mistakes and we make the same mistakes again and again. Who in this lifetime has not made the same mistake more than once? See? Theoretically, yes, I should learn from my mistakes, and once I make that mistake, I don't do it again. But reality is, we do it again, and again, and again. So this would not serve uh, or solve our problem. And also, there's another reason why we don't remember our past lives. We, the spirit souls, come from the spiritual world into the material world with the explicit purpose of enjoying independent 
of God. We want to be the number one, the enjoyer, the master, the Lord. So the material world is created by the Supreme Lord to give us a place to try to fulfill that fantasy. The reality of the world is it's not a place where we, the spirit soul, can enjoy. So to make it possible for us to experience some happiness, some pleasure here, we have to be put under illusion. We have to be put under a veil of forgetfulness of who we are, of what our real life's activity should be, what our eternal position is, etc. We have to forget that if we want to be the number one enjoyer. The material world is actually a place of misery, as declared by the Supreme Lord himself in Bhagavad Gita. He says, from the highest planet to the lowest planet, all our places of misery, of repeated birth and death. That's the way the world is designed. That's the way it is. See, But we don't want it to be like that. We want to see it as a place of pleasure for us. So, therefore, we are very quick to forget the pain. Very quick. So as we transfer from one lifetime to the next, one body to the next, each time we take a new birth, we start with a clean slate of remembrance. Oh, we look at the world with rose-colored glasses. Oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to have a good time here. There's so much facility for enjoyment. There's many opportunities where I can be number one. I can be the master. And this starts at birth. It starts with the little baby and continues throughout our life. If we could remember the reality of our past life or unlimited lives and all the suffering, all the births and the diseases, the old age, the death, the broken relationships, the difficulties, the emotional stress and all the things that go with everybody's life. If we could remember all of this, it would be very difficult for us to enjoy in this life. It would be very difficult to have an optimistic view of this life. See? An example is, if there's some big tragedy in this life, many times it destroys our enjoying mood for the rest of our life. I met a lady one time at the point that time she was, I think, 28 years old. And she had seen her parents murdered in front of her when she was five years old. And from that point until I talked to her when she was 28, she had struggled with this. And it was very difficult for her to have a fun life. To see life as, oh, this is a nice place to be. She had all kind of mental problems, psychic conditions, etc. Struggling. Mm -hmm. What if we could remember all these tragedies from all of our lifetimes? We would be a complete mess. So it's been arranged. Okay, you want to be the enjoyer. You have to be an illusion to have the full uh, optimistic view of enjoyment. And it will be arranged so you'll forget your last life and the one before that and the one before that, etc. And for those few people who do remember their last life, it disturbs their life a lot. They never really feel like this life is their real life. They keep remembering their past life. And that's who I really am. I'm not this I present identity that I have now. I'm still that person in my past life. See, and they're always struggling with that and trying to live two lives at the same time. It's not easy. So again, to help us enjoy, we forget. Um, okay, and uh, what does it mean, God or Supreme? 
What does it mean, God or supreme? Actually, the word God is a title. See, it means a position, a post. See, the title God. Just like the word king is a title. It indicates a certain position or a post. Now, a person occupies the position of God, of king, and therefore he's known as the king. And he's accepted as the number one person in the kingdom. So the supreme person is known as God, is accepted as number one, the number one person of all. You see, he has that position. But these nomenclatures indicate a personality. See, they indicate an actual person. A king is a person. The Supreme Lord is a person. See, so the Supreme Lord is the Supreme Person. You and I are people. See, I'm an individual person. You are an individual person. See, the Supreme Lord is an individual person, but He's the Supreme Person. He's the number one personality of all. And that's why the most correct way to address the personality in this position is the supreme personality of Godhead. The head God, the number one God, the number one controller, the number one master, the number one enjoyer. All of us are mini-gods. We all have the same qualities of God. He's the controller. We have a little bit of ability to control ourselves. See, He's the enjoyer. We have a little bit of ability to enjoy etc. So he is the uh, supreme God and we're many gods but we're not equal and therefore we have our position in relation to the supreme. Just like in a government there's the king and then there's many subordinate heads of different departments. They have their duties, they have their abilities, they have their powers delegated by the king. But they're all under the jurisdiction of and control of the king. They're subordinate to the king. So we're eternally subordinate to the supreme person who is known as the Adi Purusha. Adi means first. Purusha means lord or enjoyer. Um, next three questions are about meditation. Uh, what are the practical result, uh, results of meditation? Well, it depends on the meditation. All meditations are not equal. There's many different types of meditation. They will produce different results. But we are practicing and teaching mantra meditation. Mm -hmm. And so, I will answer the question from the viewpoint of what are the benefits of mantra meditation. What changes will take place in a person who practices mantra meditation? Mm. The mantras are spiritual sounds, transcendental sounds. They have spiritual power, spiritual potency. Therefore, they have the ability to change us, to actually purify us. And the purification removes the material contamination in our consciousness, in our minds, in our hearts. These illusions that I referred to previously, I'm the Lord, I'm number one, I'm very special. See, these are illusions that need to be removed. So when one chants the mantras, these gradually are removed. The illusion, I'm this material body. This is a very big illusion. This is the illusion under which we all operate. It's not true. I'm not the material body. I'm the person inside the body. So I need to have that illusion diminished and ultimately removed or replaced with the truth of who I really am. By chanting the mantras, that begins to gradually take place. The actual self-realization of the soul begins to unfold. Mm -hmm. Now along the way, as side effects, 
the mind will become more calm. The mind will become more peaceful. The various anxieties I may have will diminish and ultimately can go away. My desires can change. I can actually lose so much attachment and desire for the things of this world which actually are not good for us. See, I'm purified of these obstacles, these contaminations, and therefore my life becomes much easier. Many difficulties disappear from my life. Everything is positive. There is no negative to mantra meditation. So we have seen this take place in innumerable people, innumerable people, experienced it ourselves, and hope that others can have the same experience also because it is so beneficial to the individual and to those around that person. Um, next viewer is asking what changes one can expect after starting chanting of mantras because some people are afraid of some maybe bad effects of meditation or something. Well, I just basically answered that question. But there is no need to be afraid of any ill effect or bad effect. Impossible. It will not happen. These mantras were brought to us by the Supreme Lord Himself, Lord Goranga, 500 years ago. He said, this is the most beneficial thing you can do. He gave it to us as the best help. He, being our ever well-wisher, wants us to have this benefit in our life. With the Supreme Lord Himself, who is our most dear Father, who loves us unconditionally, give us a process that would be bad, that would somehow have some negative effect? Impossible. No, there is only positive effects. Do not worry. Have no doubt. There is no ill effect from chanting these mantras, as prescribed by the Supreme Lord and His representatives. And, of course, they should be chanted in the way that they are given. What do I have to think about while chanting mantras? How can I distract my attention from side thoughts? A lot of things are going on here, and my mind uh, all the time thinks about different material stuff. Yes, that's true. Everybody's mind is fully engaged in material thoughts. But when we come to this meditation and chant these mantras, the recommendation is that we focus our mind on the sound, the sound of the mantra. The mind needs an engagement. The mind needs somewhere to go. So we listen closely to the sound engage the, the hearing process in listening to the sound. And we focus our mind on the sound. We pay attention to the sound. And this is the engagement for the mind. The mind drifts away. You bring it back to the sound. Remember, you're spirit soul. You're not the mind. So you observe your mind going away to another place, thinking of another thing. You bring it back to the sound. You, the spirit soul. And in doing this, you actually now are involved more and more in this transcendental sound. If you cannot control your mind completely, and none of us can, really it's very difficult, do not worry. The mantras still work. They still have their effect. They still have their potency. You see. But the more we can train our mind, the better it is. You see. But it's not a frustrating thing. Don't become frustrated. Don't give up. Oh, I can't do it. I can't focus on this sound. Just gently bring the mind to the sound as you can and when you can. And do not worry. The mantras have their effect. See, you 
are getting great benefit. Is that true that if I chant mantra silently, it will have more effect than chanting out loud? No, it is not true. It is actually the opposite of being true. Again, we are following the directions of, the instructions of Lord Goranga. These instructions have come to us through our line of perfect teachers, known as our disciplic succession or parampara. And Lord Goranga and the great saint Haridas Thakur, who was known as the supreme authority on the chanting of the holy names, Lord Goranga himself declared that. They both have told us that the most potency and the most beneficial for oneself and other people as well is to chant the mantras out loud. And the more people that congregate together and chant the mantras together, the more the potency. Again, this is the arrangement. This is the system. So we do not subscribe to this idea that if you chant the mantras silently, they'll be more potent. No, this is not correct. And uh, one person asks, uh, is it possible to make a spiritual progress without chanting Maha Mantra. First, let me just add one thing to the last question, which I can't even remember. What it was. Anyway, we'll go to this next question. Out loud and out loud chanting and silent chanting. No, I know, but uh, oh, I know what it was. Here's here's another point about the the difference between chanting silently and chanting out loud. When you chant silently, there is more likelihood that your mind will drift around more. You're sitting there chanting silently and the mind just drifts from one place to another place. More difficult to control the mind. When you chant out loud and focus on that external sound, it keeps the mind centered and focused more. Even if you're chanting out loud very softly and you notice that the mind begins to drift, if you increase the volume of your chanting, you'll know it brings the mind back. Just like if you want to get some person's attention, you may raise your voice a little bit. Hey, come here. See? Oh, they listen. They, they come. So it grabs our attention more when we chant out loud. Now, the next question was again? Um, is about, um, is it possible to make spiritual progress without chanting mantras? Mantras or maha mantra? Maha mantra. Yes, it is. Of course. See, spiritual progress means actually coming closer in your loving relationship with the Supreme Lord. That's what spiritual progress means. It's not some geographical thing. You're climbing some ladder or, you know, whatever our minds may envision spiritual progress is. It is a strengthening of the relationship between the individual soul and the supreme soul. Now, as with all relationships, the more you follow the guidance of the person who you're trying to develop the relationship with. The more you please the person that you're developing the relationship with, the more you do their will, etc., then the closer the relationship becomes. The more rebellious we are, the further away we are in that relationship. So we have been given various activities by the Supreme Lord himself that please him, that actually purify us, that bring us closer to him. Chanting is the first. See, Actually, the first is hearing. First we hear. So just hearing about the Lord, his activities, his pastimes, his world, etc., etc., this will help us in our progress. Hearing. And chanting, yes, we should chant. Chant the mantras, and there's many mantras. We should also chant 
the Lord's glories. We hear the Lord's glories in Scripture from the words of the spiritual master, etc. And then we repeat those, we chant those. That is also going to very much increase the relationship. But as far as chanting goes, the Maha Mantra is the supreme mantra. Maha means great, mantra means mind deliverer. Of all mantras, the Maha Mantra is the number one mantra. And it is the mantra recommended for this Kali Yuga, which is the age we live in now. So certainly, we should chant the Maha Mantra if we choose to do so. Notice I say, if we choose to do so. See, no one can make anyone do anything. But this is the mantra prescribed specifically by Lord Goranga for the Kali Yuga. This is the mantra he chanted. This is the mantra he taught other people. So, being a follower of Lord Goranga, it's only natural that we chant the Maha Mantra. Only natural. But again, if someone has some aversion to this, they, they for whatever reason, find that they can't chant this mantra, then chant other mantras that are given by Lord Goranga. Like, Haribo Nitai Gaur, or Goranga Nitai Gaur, or Gopala Govindarama, Madana Mohana. There are very, very wonderful mantras, but the Maha Mantra also, number one of all mantras. Is it possible to use these mantras if I'm engaged in other yoga processes? Yes, of course. And a lot of people are engaged in various yoga processes, you know. The main uh, activity of the, quote, modern-day yogi is Hatha Yoga. See, why? Because we uh, are more interested in the body than the spiritual uh, purity of the soul. So, Hatha Yoga is so popular around the world. Mm -hmm. A very good, amazing benefits for the body, and it also helps control the mind to some degree. Mm -hmm improves one's health, and so on. But that doesn't mean you can't chant the mantras or you're engaged in some other yoga. You know, maybe you have other processes and techniques that you use. But you can still chant the mantras. The mantras are purifying no matter who chants them and where, you see. So there's certainly no restriction on, oh, you do some other yoga, you can't chant these mantras. No, everybody can chant these mantras, no matter what you do. What can you say about sound OM? The sound OM is transcendental sound. It is a very popular mantra among the, quote, uh, popular yogas on the planet today. Mm -hmm. And those who actually understand and have very, very clear vision see that Om is the Supreme Person Himself in that sound. And that the Maha Mantra and the Mantra Om are the same. However, we who are developing our personal relationships with the Personality of Godhead are more attracted, oftentimes, to the personal names of God, like Krishna, Rama, Govinda, Gopala, Goranga, Chaitanya. These personal names, see, they remind us of a person. They remind us of the Supreme Person. We're attracted to that. This is what we like to do. This is what is also recommended. However, throughout various Vedic mantras, the, the, the pranava or omkara sound vibration will be found. And we also have various mantras that we regularly chant that conclude the mantra om. See, om namo bhagavate vasudevaya or uh, nama om vishnu, etc. Mm. Now, the person who or let's, let's say the yogi, the practitioner, the transcendentalist, who does not accept this ultimate absolute truth to be a person, 
is very attracted to the sound om because om does not actually bring to mind a personality. It's like a void or it's like an energy or it's like an all-encompassing vibration, etc. It's said that om is the sound of the universe, etc. It's, it's very attractive to the, what we call impersonalist, people who do not see the ultimate absolute truth as a person, but as an impersonal for, force or a, a light, a, a void, etc. So they use this mantra Om a lot because they're not really comfortable with names of the personality of Godhead, like Krishna, for instance, or Rama. Not, not so comfortable, but Om, oh, it opens up unlimited uh, avenues and, and to them, you see, and uh, the, the eternal and so on like this. So it's very attractive among the impersonalist. And um, what is the difference between saying hi and saying Haribo? <laughs> What is the difference between saying hi and haribo? Completely different. Hi, hello, etc. These are material sound vibrations. Your friend comes up and you say hello. This is nice, it's friendly, it's cordial, but it's material sound vibration. But when your friend comes up and you say haribo, now that is completely different. Now they are in the presence of transcendental sound. And they, the spirit soul, receive spiritual benefit. So actually you've helped them spiritually. Whereas when you say hi, you don't help them spiritually at all. You see. So again, we try to operate as much as possible on the spiritual level that helps people spiritually. If I can greet somebody with Hari Bowl, and help them spiritually, then that's what I do. And saying hi, I understand well they're, they're gonna like that. Oh, hi, how are you? But I don't really help them spiritually. So there's more I could do for them by saying hi, Bo. And <clears throat> next question is, um, how my everyday life's activities be a part of my spiritual life? This is the science of bhakti yoga. How to make it so everything we do in our life is a part of our spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And a spiritual life is a life that's done in service to God. So in our bhakti yoga process, we learn this art. This art of living in such a way that what seem like mundane material activities actually are spiritual. This is a great science. Mm -hmm. I have to maintain my body in so many different ways. I have to keep it clean. I have to have all kinds of dental hygiene. I have to take uh, for exercise. I, keep, I have to keep it physically fit. I have to, you know, wear clothes. All kinds of maintenance things with the body. Mm -hmm. But if I'm using that body in God's service, then that's part of my service. And of course, eating is so necessary. Our eating and our drinking, absolute requirement. You don't eat, you don't drink, you don't stay in your body very long. So in the science of bhakti yoga, we learn how to offer all the food that we take into our bodies, we offer it to God before we eat it. Vegetarian foodstuffs, by the way. No meat, no fish, no eggs. God says, offer your foodstuffs to me. But he won't accept meat, fish, or eggs. So therefore, automatically, the person who is truly spiritually uh, following God's desires and instructions, is a vegetarian, automatically. The devotee of God is an automatic vegetarian. 
And along with that comes all kind of health benefits, ecological benefits, economic benefits, all the things that are so beneficial by a person adopting a vegetarian lifestyle are automatically present in the life of a devotee of the Supreme Lord because he's doing this as an offering to God. So basically everything, our work. In general, we have to work to maintain ourselves. It's part of material life. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, everybody has to work. Everybody has to work the way it's designed. But the devotee of bhakti yoga actually understands and learns how he can work in God's service. So the fruit of his labor, he uses that fruit in God's service. The fruit of most labor is a paycheck. See, so you take that paycheck, you use what you need to maintain your body, your situation, whatever it is, your family, whatever. Everybody's got many situations to maintain. And then you use some of that money in direct service to God. See, Then your work is connected. Everything you do is connected and therefore you go through your daily life and you make spiritual progress as a result. Mm -hmm. So those who come to us and learn this science, they know how to do this. It's not difficult. It may sound complicated right now. It's not difficult. See? Your consciousness changes. You start understanding how to do this. Your intelligence is awakened. You understand. You have the intelligence to see how I can do this, 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 and make it all part of my spiritual life. And next question is, uh, how can we know the will of the Supreme? Yeah, this is important. If we're told you should do the will of God, then the next question is obvious. How do I know what he wants me to do? <laughs> he reveals his desires to us in three basic ways. In the Vedic scriptures, and when I say Vedic scriptures, I mean authorized Vedic scriptures, not just anything that has the label Veda on it. There's so many so-called Vedic scriptures that are not authorized. They've got all kinds of incorrect information in them. They've been changed and altered. We're not talking about that. We're talking about pure, bona fide, authorized scriptures that come down through a line of perfect teachers. So when I refer to the Vedas, this is what I'm referring to. So in the Vedic scriptures, for instance, Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, it is clearly indicated there what God wants us to do. So many instructions, so many guidelines, so many do, so many don'ts. See, he wants us to do this. Lord Gauranga came and he told us, you should do this. What the Lord said, we should do. This is what he wants us to do. The spiritual master guides us, directs us in our life. See, philosophically, practically, all kinds of guidance. See, this is God's will. This is what he wants us to do. And ultimately, in our hearts, there's an expansion of God known as the Paramatma, the Lord in the heart. And he will also guide us. And he will confirm this truth that we receive from Scripture and from the spiritual master. He will confirm, this is true. You should do this. You should follow this. See, So if we're sincere about doing the will of God, it's not hard to know what he wants us to do. If we don't want to know God's will, we'll always say, I don't know what he wants me to do. I'm not sure. Yeah, you say this, but I don't know. See, we'll be filled with doubt and skepticism and and reluctance and all of this, and therefore we'll have our excuse. But if we're sincere, we'll know. And another person is asking, why did the soul come into the material world from spiritual world? Yeah, that's always a question. 
we come into the material world from the spiritual world because we made a big mistake. <laughs> you see, as I mentioned early on, we're parts and parcels of the supreme soul, little sparks of God. So we have the same qualities as God himself, but in minute quantity. So all the characteristics of God are also present within ourself, you see. So God is number one, so we also have that tendency to be number one. He's the supreme enjoyer, we also have that tendency. He's the master, he's the Lord. We also have that, little bits of that, etc. Now, we also have an eternal free will, as given by God himself. Eternal free will. And we also have a little minute independence to exercise that will. There's no such thing as having a free will if we have no ability to use it. So we have a little independence to use our free will. So at some point, and do not try to understand this or know when it was, or it's not logical, but at some point, we decide we want to exercise our independence and be number one, be the master, be the Lord, be the enjoyer. There's no facility in the spiritual world for me to execute that desire because there's already number one person there. God fulfills all those positions exclusively in the spiritual world. So to give me a place where I can come and try to fulfill my fantasies, he creates the material world. And we come into the material world with this agenda. I'm going to be the Lord. And that's the game we play as long as we're here. Until we realize this game doesn't work. I'm not the Lord. Somehow, something's wrong. And then we begin to question who we really are. And what is our real position? What should I really do with my life? And then God puts us in contact with this knowledge through the spiritual master, through the scriptures, etc. And we began to relearn the truth, you see, reestablish that lost relationship, become rehabilitated. And when we do this to completion, we go back to the spiritual world. And the last question is, um most of the people think that they will be happy if their most cherished desires will come true. And there are a lot of techniques uh, in internet and other sources of how we can fulfill our material desires. It also includes some stages of meditation, concentration, contemplation and so on. And what do you think, is it possible to fulfill our desires with the help of meditation, concentration and so on? Yeah, this is part of the big illusion. That I'll be happy if I can fulfill all my desires. But the reality is, often we fulfill our desires and it doesn't make us happy. The world is full of people who have had many, many of their desires, their goals in life, their dreams fulfilled, and they're not happy. There's this huge illusion all over the planet. If I win the lottery, I'll be happy. See, Every lottery in every country is very prosperous because people have this idea. If I buy this ticket and it's the winning ticket and I win this jackpot, I'll be happy. See, And there's always, again and again, a winner, another winner, another winner, but they're not happy people. In fact, if you look at the history of the winners, many of them say they wish they'd have never won. Their lives are worse than they've ever been. See? Oh, it was my desire to win the lottery. I won the lottery. And then I fulfilled all kinds of other desires with the money from the lottery. And I'm still miserable. You see? So none of these things work because we're spirit soul. We're not the material bodies. Material desires no matter how great they are and how fulfilled they may be, don't make the soul happy, you see. So, can you fulfill these desires through meditation? Oh, some meditation techniques or concentration techniques or so on may help, you see. 
all kinds of different little tricks can be employed to increase your power, your ability to get what you want. The world's been full of those people since time immemorable, you see. All the, the false lords, the kings, the conquerors, all these people, they employed their techniques to get what they wanted. Vast kingdoms, many subjects, many slaves, unlimited sex life, etc., etc. It was one meditation or another, one technique or another. See, they got it and they weren't happy. They're gone. They've, they've, they've disappeared. Now they're in some other body. They don't even remember all their success and who they were and, you know, all the enjoyment they had, so-called enjoyment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. See, so it's all illusion. We do not promote any of this. We say, do not do this meditation that we teach for these material gains. If you do this meditation and you get some material results, you do. But that's not what we're teaching. We're teaching, do this and develop love for God. This is what will make you happy, you see. And along the way, if your health improves or your relationships improve or, you know, your, your financial situation improves, what, so what? If it does, great. If it doesn't, great. It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with you and your spiritual happiness. And uh, what would you like to wish our viewers at the end? I would like to wish our viewers and everybody the best spiritually, you see. We care about people's material well-being. We wish you health. We wish you harmony in your life and material happiness. But we most of all wish you spiritual happiness, you see. This is the most crucial thing. And if you're spiritually happy, you will be happy. If you're materially happy, you won't be really happy, you see. So we wish happiness to everyone. If you're spiritually healthy, you're healthy. Your body may not be healthy, but you are healthy. Spiritual health is true wealth, you see. So we wish you the best in all endeavors. But remember, those endeavors which may be very, very beneficial for you materially, may not be beneficial for you spiritually. You should consider this. And those endeavors which will be beneficial for you spiritually may not be the best for you materially. So one has to choose, you see. We can't have it all. That's a fact. We can't have it all. But I can tell you the real gem the real precious gift, the real uh, achievement in life is spiritual happiness. So we thank you very much for taking the time to listen to these uh, answers to these questions that some of you have sent in. I know there's unlimited questions that people can ask, see. But really the answer is all the same. Develop your love for God. Develop your spiritual life. Put time and energy in spiritual development. And don't spend your whole life in your material pursuits. Thank you very much and Haribo. Thank you very much, Palakidas. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, Asaladas, for having me. Namaste. Thank Namaste. you. Namaste. Haribo.